For our passage today, we're going to be reading the entirety of the third epistle of John, and we're going to do that in an effort to answer one question. I want you guys to remember this. This is the question. What is the essence of love and truth? What is the essence of love and truth? Now, the supreme goal we have today, right, is in the worship of our Lord and Savior. But brothers and sisters, if there's one thing you guys can take away today, if there's one thing you get from this, I want you guys to walk away today from this church service loving our Lord Jesus more than you walked in. That is my desire in this. There's no load I'm wanting to put on your shoulders as we go through this passage. It's, it's to point us and aim us to the cross of our Lord, and Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for us and who's resurrected from the grave, claiming the sufficiency of us being pardoned from our sins because of his sacrifice. And church, what I will propose to you today is that the message we're going to find in what is the smallest book in all of the Bible, in all of Scripture, is not one that is specific to John alone. Rather, it is reflected throughout the entire narrative of Scripture. And I want you to listen to these verses. Genesis 12.3 says this, And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Exodus 9.16, But indeed, for this reason I have caused you to stand in order to show you my power and in order to recount my name through all the earth. John, Joshua 4.24, That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of Yahweh is strong. 1 Kings 8.60, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God. There is no one else. 1 Chronicles 16.23, sing to Yahweh all the earth. Proclaim good news of His salvation from day to day. Psalm 22.27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh and all the families of the nations will worship before you. Isaiah 45.22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Ezekiel 39, 21, and I will put my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment which I have executed, and my hand which I have placed on them. Haggai 2, 7, and I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the desirable things of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in the whole world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In Revelation 7.9, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now church, I want you to keep these texts in mind as we seek to answer the question uh, for this morning. And before we get into it, let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace toward us. Lord Jesus, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Lord Jesus, that you, when you were crucified, you said it is finished. God, there is nothing we can add to our salvation, Lord God. That salvation belongs to Yahweh, to Yahweh alone. Oh Lord, would you speak to us through your word. God, may we be humble in our approach toward this text, Lord Jesus, and receive it, Lord Jesus, what you are doing in our lives. God, may we change, may we be sanctified by your word. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, 3 John is written to a beloved Gaius around AD 85 to 95. Now, there are a couple of things that are worthy to note as it relates to this letter. First, while the recipient of this letter is Gaius, it nonetheless serves the same meaning for us today, and that the purpose of this letter was to encourage not just Gaius when he received it, but the entirety of the church body of which he was associated And second, what we see throughout is that in just 15 verses, John utilizes various forms of both truth and love, a total of seven times each, repeating much of what we see through his gospel account and the other two epistles. Now, for us to understand the contents of this letter, we must define both truth and love as it is reflected, not in our own ideas or not what society calls or defines these two terms, but as it is reflected in the biblical narrative. Now, let us begin with love. What is love? Well, there's three things I want us to take away from this first. First, God is love. Now, we see this reflected in 1 John 4, verse 16. It explicitly states this exact phrase, God is love. Therefore, love is the very essence, the very very nature of who God is. The second thing we take away from the biblical narrative is that God defines and exemplifies love. Man, culture, we do not define it, God does. 1 John 4.10 says this, It is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
So it was the love of God for sinners that spurred him, our God, to action in saving us, not because of anything we had done or because we had loved him. The love of God transcends the will of man and his hell-bound heart by willingly offering himself in their place that they may receive eternal life. Third, love controls and transforms the child of God. Love controls and transforms the child of God. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says this, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And this is the driving force of our lives, church. The love of God that has been poured into us through Jesus Christ that we may be crucified with Christ, so that it is no longer that we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. In short, to summarize these three points, I would say this this way. The love of God, exemplified by God, transforms the people of God to love and live for God. This is what love does, and this is the essence of who love is. Next, let's look at truth. Let's define truth as it's related in the biblical narrative. First, what we see is that Jesus, Jesus is truth. He says this in John 14, 6. He says that he is the way, that he is the truth, and he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Truth is personified in Christ, and it is exclusive to Christ. This is why what we see in 1 John 2, 22, when he says, anyone who denies Jesus is an antichrist and a liar. To deny Jesus is to deny truth itself. Second, the word of God is truth. The word of God is truth. John 17, 17 says this, Jesus praying to the Father says, sanctify them in your truth, thy word is truth. What this statement means is that everything we read from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation is truth. This is our basis, our foundation of truth. It is unwavering, self-attesting, in need of nothing and no one else to affirm it, substantiated on none other than the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this brings us to our third point of truth. The purpose of Jesus was truth. We see this in John 18, 37. Jesus answers Pilate and says, You yourself said, I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. This is Jesus speaking. Simply put, Jesus came to bear witness about himself. What was spoken by the fathers and prophets long ago had now been manifested, revealed, and displayed in the Son of God who gave himself for us. Now, what is profound to note about this relationship of truth and love is that the manner in which they reflect the very nature of who God is in that, though they are one in essence, they nonetheless remain distinct from one another. In other words, truth is not actually truth apart from love. You can't just have one. You have to have both, and they are the same essence. And love is not actually love. You're not being loving towards somebody unless you're, you're giving truth with it. Now, some of the examples that we see in this to, to kind of buttress this point is First uh, John three eighteen. He says this: We are to love in truth. Ephesians four fifteen. We are to speak the truth in love. Now, reminiscent of this is what we see reflected in the Godhead, in that Jesus, who is truth, is also God, who is love. Truth is not love, and love is not truth, though they're the same essence, namely both of God. In the same way, in which the Father is not the Son, nor is the Son the Spirit, though they are the same essence, one being all equally God. So it's no surprise, church, as we speak about this, that the world continues to do everything it can to fight against the very nature of who God is. That's why they fight against love. That's why they want to redefine these terms. And this brings us to our our, the first point that I want to get out of this passage, and that is love rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. Let's begin opening in of in verse one. It says this the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brothers came and bore witness to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So right away what we see is this use of love and truth present in the very opening verse. It's again supporting that the understanding of these truth and love, they're inseparable. They are together. Now, such love and care that John reflects of his fellow beloved Gaius is not simply one that is spiritual, 
but we see that it's reflected in his physical well-being as well. We see that in verse 2. Now, this provides more context to our understanding of love and truth. And then as we see in James 2, we're not simply people, we're not brothers and sisters who, who tell, our, tell each other to go in peace, be warned, be filled. Rather, what we do is we clothe them, we feed them, and we care for both their physical and their spiritual needs. Even so, while John does care of the physical well-being of his brother, he has brought no greater joy than to hear of the spiritual well-being of Gaius in walking in the truth. This is, this is what's causing him to be overly elated. And we know this because of his repeated use of truth, including the phrase, walking in the truth in these first four verses. Now, what is this walking in the truth of which John speaks? What is he talking about here? Now, while there are several passages we could look to in order to understand this, the immediate context of what we see of what John is talking about is found in those preceding verses. And this brings us to our second point, and that love supports the truth. Love supports the truth. Beginning in verse 5, we see this. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers. And you're doing this, though they're strangers. And they bore witness to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, receiving nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. So here what we see, brothers and sisters, is an outworking an outworking of what it means for us to walk as a body of believers in truth. It's a faithful service of the body of Christ in support of the discipling of the nations, the Great Commission, the going out for the sake of the name. Now, there are a couple of details that we want to note about this particular scenario. The first thing that we see is in verses 5 through 7, it shows that the support of these laborers, right, the church willingly giving over what they can uh, to help these men, or woman, or from the church, is not based on a personal relationship that they had with each other. And nor was it based on what these labors could offer the church, but it was simply based on a mutual purpose of the furthering of the name of Jesus. That's what they had in common. Had no idea who each other was, but what they knew is that they wanted the name of Jesus to be proclaimed to all nations, and that church wanted to have the name of Jesus proclaimed to all nations. That was their common purpose. That was what united them together. And second, whether they were supporting, whether they were serving, or whether they were being sent, each of these brothers had a responsibility of equal importance and necessity for the furtherance of the name of Jesus to the nations. In short, these labors of Jesus were supported by the people of Jesus as the body of Jesus for proclamation of the name of Jesus. That's what they were doing. And this is our purpose. This is our purpose as the church this is the outworking of walking in and supporting the church, the truth, excuse me. This is the purpose of our existence. When we ask the question, like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I here? This is it right here. It was we're enjoying God. And he has given us this, this command, this, this opportunity to enjoy himself and to tell other people the same thing. This is why we have our gatherings. This is why we have our studies. This is why we have our finances. It's not meant to just stay with us. We're not people that just keep consuming and consuming and consuming and go back to our homes and leave this truth with us. No. We do this at the name of Jesus Christ. The gospel message would be proclaimed among all nations, not just in San Antonio, not just Texas, not just the United States. Every country, every continent, that everyone would know that Yahweh is God, there is none other. Even so, each of us is called to a specific role in God's plan of salvation. As it is written, we see it in 1 Corinthians 12, 18. He says this, But now God has appointed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. And he himself gave some as, he gave some as apostles, the sent out ones. He gave some as prophets. He gave some as evangelists. He gave some as pastors and teachers, all for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. God has done that. So I'm taking these things, church, and I want, I'm going to say something that's very important for, for all of us to understand, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you some, some support to this from the biblical narrative, but, but here it is. I want us to really understand this, and that is we're not all missionaries. We are not all missionaries, and I don't say this as a rebuke. I, I say this out as, an, as an encouragement. I say this that in the biblical sense, unless you are being sent out, you're literally leaving your home, you're up and leaving, never to return. That's what we see is, is the, the definition of the, of the apostle here in the, in the scriptures. Unless you are doing those things, you are, you're not a missionary. And here, here's some biblical support for that statement. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this. Paul, in his, you know, his rhetorical question, he says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? The answer is no, and that's okay. We are Christ's body and individually members of it. 
Let's, let's look at another example, though. 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, during their flight from Saul, David and his 600 men, they arrive at their home in Ziklag, and they find the Amalekites, they've burned everything, they've destroyed everything, they've taken their families away, and they're mourning, they're mourning, they want their families back, so, so, so David throws on his ephod, ephod and, then, and after receiving an answer from Yahweh to pursue the Amalekites and overtake them, David and his 600 men, they walk through this treacherous terrain for about three days, they have minimal food, minimal water, David himself hasn't ate or drank anything in those three days. Now, right before they get to the final attack, 200 of these men, they get to what we would call an objective rally point. Basically, it's this advantageous spot where I can see what we're about to go do, but they hopefully can't see us, and so we're, we're developing a plan of attack to get in there. Well, when they get there, there's 200 men that come up, and they're like, we are too exhausted to go any further. And, then, and they're instructed then by David. He says, well, you're going to remain at the baggage. The rest of us, me and these 400 men, we're going to go down into the camp. We're going to destroy the Amalekites. We're going to take all the spoils, and we're going to rescue our family, but I need you guys to stay at the baggage. Well, following such an incredible win, David, the 400 men, and all the families, they return to the baggage where the 200 men who were too exhausted to go any further, they remain there. Now, this is what is stated next in chapter 30, verses 22 and 24. He says this, Then all the evil and vile men among those who went with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have delivered except to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then David said, You must not do so, my brothers, with what Yahweh has given us, who has kept us and given into our hand the band that came against us, and who will listen to you in this matter. For as is the portion of the one who goes down to the battle, so shall the portion be of the one who remains by the baggage. They shall be apportioned together. Now what is David doing here? What is David saying here? Well, the emphasis that he's being placed on is is the name of Yahweh. It's not on David. He's not saying we're better than these guys. We're stronger than these guys. It's because we trained harder. It's because we put out more. It's because we knew more. That's why these Amalekites were delivered to the hands. No. He attributed the victory to Yahweh. He said the only reason that we even made it this far, the only reason why we were able to go down into the battle, the only reason why we were able to slay those Amalekites and and save our families and return the spoil isn't because of anything we did. It's because God kept us. Yahweh kept us. And that's what these vile men did not understand, these 400 men. They said, well, no, the victory belongs to me. We're the ones that put out. And he said, no, 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 no. It all belongs to Yahweh. It's the same thing we see in in Psalm 3.8. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. It is not to us. And not only that, but David, he, he gives the spoil to all these people. And not only them, but every single city that they had crossed into that gave them bread, that gave them water, that gave them clothing, that gave them shelter, he spread all the spoil to all of them. Reminiscent of this is what we see in Ephesians 4, and it says that Jesus ascended giving good gifts to men. Jesus did the work. It was salvation that belongs to Christ alone. And what does he do? He doesn't hold the blessing to himself. He gives it out. What a humble God we serve, a loving God we serve. So why should we place any more emphasis on somebody who is going out as though they are more important, as though they have this higher esteem or preeminence than anybody else? We don't. That is not the call of the body of Christ. Church, we don't call every Christian a pastor. Though every, every Christian does something related to pastoral work, right? They'll do counseling. They'll, they'll disciple. They might even preach. But that doesn't mean that they're a pastor. And we don't call every Christian a deacon, though every Christian does serve into some capacity. And we don't call every Christian an evangelist, though everyone does share the gospel. Therefore, church, we should not call every Christian a missionary, even though they do participate in some extent to mission work. Now, why is this important to understand? Why why, why do we need to drive this point home, specifically from this context that we find ourselves in our scripture for today? Well, church, we need a body of believers who are confident in their identity in Christ. We need a body who knows their role as a sender or a goer and to do that well. We need those that are willing to go out for the name, and we need those that are willing to support such people in a manner of worthy of God that God may receive glory and God, God, brothers and sisters, I'm saying this from a perspective that I remember being that guy several years ago. I'm still in the military, and I look at my wife, and we're, 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 we're getting this, like, knowledge. We're just being inundated with this, the lostness of the world. And I look at my wife, and I'm saying, honey, unless we are in Afghanistan administering for the, for the sake of the gospel, we're not Christians. And the reason why I did that to my folly is because I was slapping my identity on something I needed to do in order to earn God's favor so that he could look on me with love. And that's not what it is. 
Brothers and sisters, we don't slap an identity on ourselves. We don't put missionary on ourselves so that I can feel like, okay, now I'm actually doing something for the kingdom of God. I'm not going to be these 200, I'm not going to be these guys that come back and go, who are these people in this baggage? They don't deserve anything. Because their identity is based on what they were doing instead of who, what Christ had already done. Brothers and sisters, that is, this is the call as a Christian. We don't hold our identity in anything in this world. As a husband, as a father, as a man, as a woman, as a mother, as a brother or sister, none of those, those aren't our identity. The one, the one phrase we have is in Christ. That's the identity that you have. And there's nothing you can add to it and there's nothing you can take away. Christ has earned that. Christ has done it on our behalf. He became sin who knew no sin so we could become the righteousness of God. That is why God looks on us with favor. That is why God looks on us with love. That is why God smiles and rejoices over us with singing. Not because of you going out and doing anything for him. It did it because Christ has already done it for you. That's the beauty of the gospel. Now in the same way that David and his men would have been able, they wouldn't have been able to fight with the excess baggage and weight that they had to carry, but they left it to these 200 exhausted men to watch. Nor can missionaries bring the gospel message. Listen to this. Missionaries cannot bring the gospel message to the uttermost parts of the world without the dedicated love, prayer, and physical and financial support of the sending body of the church. This right here, church, is what it means to be fellow workers with the truth. If we are not going, then we are supporting. And if we're not doing either, then we're being disobedient to our Lord. This is our call as the body of Christ. Now, unfortunately, what we see in the next couple of verses is that there's a, there are those who, they're going di- to disagree with this sentiment. And that brings us to our next point. It's that love fights for the truth. Love fights for the truth. We, we see this in verse 9. It says this, I wrote something to the church. This is John again speaking. He says, by Diotrephes, Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not welcome what we say. Now, right away, what we see is a clash in terms used by John. Now, while the, John, the love that John is describing up to this point in Scripture, it was others-focused. It was this the agape kind of love. The love that is described of, of Diotrephes was a, was a Philippatuo love. It's a love which aspires to preeminence. Being number one, it is all about me. The highest level of superiority. This is the clash that John is describing. What Diotrephes was concerned more for was his own fame. Diotrephes cared more about his own name. Diotrephes cared about his own glory, his own well-being, than that of the name of Jesus and for his people. And we see more of this in verse 10. It says this, For this reason, if I come, I will bring to remembrance his deeds, which he does, unjustly disparaging us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not welcome the brothers either. And he forbids those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Diotrephes has spoken evil against John. Diotrephes has rejected the coming of these laborers, these missionaries that are looking for support so they can go out and do the work of the ministry. As one scholar notes, this, the, what, what we see here is it's not a theological issue that John has with Diotrephes. It's not a social issue and it's not an ecclesiological issue. Very simply put, what we see is that Diotrephes cared more about himself, his opinions, his desires, him looking good, than he did about anything else. Diotrephes was all about him. And John fought against it. This phrase, bring to remembrance, if we look at its original Greek, it's one which implies an expression of severe disapproval, a censoring of this man. For John, there was no tolerance for anyone in the church, none, who would aspire to this kind of level of preeminence, to putting themselves first, to disparaging others, creating division, hurting others, especially if it meant hindrance to gospel work. And this is not the only kind of time we see this in Scripture, this calling out of one of these individuals. We see it in 1 Timothy 1.20. Paul says, says, I've delivered him, Aeneas, and Alexander over to Satan. Why? That they may learn not to blaspheme. And again, in 2 Timothy, Paul calls out even more individuals. He says, Demas, Phagellus, Hermogenes, Hymenaeus, Philetus. These men have been sinful and, and have deserted the people of God. And he calls them out by name. And why does he do this? I thought, that's not very loving. That's not, that's, not being, that's not being kind to somebody. Why does he do that? He does it because of Ephesians 5.11. It says this, Do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. 
Now, this does not mean that every single time that we have a theological disagreement with somebody, someone messes up with something, they, 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 they say something that's not necessarily biblical, that does not mean that we're calling them out and calling them heretics and kicking them out of the church. No, this kind of command, these, this, this sort of calling out, this is reserved for the Benny Hens of our world. This is reserved for the Kenneth Copelands of our world. The people that desire the preeminence, the name of them across all nations, tribes, and tongues. That the money would be given to them in support to do their own ministry and spend it on their own needs instead of for the sake of Jesus Christ. Those are the kind of men that are enemies of this church. They are the diatrophies of our day. Brothers, there is no place, none, in the body of Christ for self-centered, build my own kingdom, wolves in sheep's clothing. There is none. We do not tolerate such men. Us as, a, as brothers and sisters, we don't tolerate them. We fight against them. We face them head on. We don't shrink back. Why? Because of, we're big tough guys? No, because Jesus is worthy of it. Christ has gone before us. That's why we do it. We walk in the workmanship that Christ has already prepared beforehand. That's what we're doing. We do it because we love Jesus. We do it because we love his kingdom. We do it because we love our fellow brothers and sisters that we don't want them going off astray. That's why we're doing it. Because we care for each other. Because we love Christ. And we love his bride. And we love the truth. And moving forward, we see uh, in verses 11 through 15, we read this. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good witness from everyone, from the truth itself. And we add our witness, and you know that our witness is true. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Now, following this example of diatrophies, we see in verse 11 there's an instruction to imitate what is good over what is evil. Not only this, but such imitation, as John explains, is one that is reflective of the salvific work of God in the life of the believer. Well, anything contrary to this reflects the absence of such. Now, this is not to be mistaken, again, as though such imitation of good is necessary for salvation, right? We've already talked about it. Rather, it is the evidence of salvation. It's the evidence of salvation. A good illustration that we can see in Scripture is found in John chapter 15, verse 5. Here Jesus states this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Now, brothers and sisters, in the same way, fruit is not produced by the branch. Because if anything the branch even did, fruit is produced because of the vine. We do not imitate good in order to earn favor with God. We imitate good because of God. Now, for John, Demetrius is an example of this. That's why he provides his name. You see, that there's an outworking of God in him. He, he's walking and supporting the truth. And it's evident in such a way that the truth itself, the brothers and he, bear witness to it. This, again, is indicative of the salvific work of God in the believer. Good fruit that is visible and known. And it's not by introspection. I'm not looking at myself and trying to analyze, like, do I have this actual good fruit? Working it over and over and over to a point of morbidity. And I'm also not boasting about it. And I'm not telling everybody all the good things I'm doing. It's fellow brothers and sisters in the faith who can testify as such. They can look at you and say, wow, you will know them by their fruits. As Matthew 7, 16 says, that's what Jesus says in comparing these antichrists to people that are actually in the faith. You'll know them by their fruits. So what we see to this point is that in verses 1 through 8, it's that John has provided a description of what such imitation of good entails. That's what verses 1 and 8 are supposed to do, and which we would do well to do the same. In short, what we see is the body of Christ coming together for the proclamation of the name of Jesus from every nation, tribe, and tongue, that the whole world would know Yahweh is God, there is none other. I want to say that again. Really listen to this. It is the body of Christ coming together for the proclamation of the name of Jesus from every nation, tribe, and tongue, that the whole world, the whole world, would know that Yahweh is God. There is none other. In the closing of his letter, John confirms his love and truth for Gaius and that he's expressing his willingness to see him soon. He's, he's choosing personal interactions over pen and ink. And furthermore, what we see is an exhortation of deepened relationships within the body 
of the, of the believers. That we're not simply to be, we're not supposed to be foreign to each other. He's saying it's like you, you are to know each other by name, greet each other by name. This is loving, this is to love in truth. Now we've covered a lot. We've covered a lot through this, this, this passage. It's such a short letter, but it is just, it's filled with so much richness. And here's what I want us to get across. Here's what I want to get across. If there is anything you've heard of all the stuff that I've talked about today, if there's anything to be taken away from the text, it's this. This one statement. We are to go, we are to send for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. We are to go or we are to send for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, do not be like Diotrephes. Do not be that person. Do not be the one who desires their own glory, who seeks to hold on to, to their lives and to proclaim their name and to hold on to their name over the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we need to let go. Let go. Let go of your lives. Let go of our lives. As it is written, for whoever wishes to save his life, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for the sake of Jesus and the gospels will save it. Brothers and sisters, he is calling each of us to this glorious gospel work. And it is not out of burden, but that we may find rest for our souls that all nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues would know the freedom and forgiveness of their sins, that they could find rest for their souls, not in anything that they are doing, but in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that they cannot earn favor with God, that Vishnu can't save them, Allah can't save them, the God of Mormonism can't save them, that only Jesus Christ can save you. And this is the answer to our questions, brothers, the one that we talked about in the beginning. God's heart, the essence of love and truth, is simply the gospel message. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This, brothers and sisters, this is the essence of love and truth. This is the heart of God. And this is our call as his people. May we go out, may we send out. For the sake of his name, let us pray.